morning, class. Nice to see you again. I trust you had a relaxing weekend and a happy Halloween, whatever a happy Halloween is. Uh, you'll recall that last time we were talking about the process of cell transformation. And recall what I said was that transformation represents the conversion of a normal cell into a cancer cell. In fact, there are a variety of traits of a cell which suggest it's a cancer cell. It changes its shape. Um, it can uh, get along with far less growth factors. Normal cells require tethering to the bottom of a Petri dish in order to grow. Cancer cells, you can put them into a semi-solid medium like agar, and cancer cells will often grow like this as colonies in suspension without uh, direct tethering with, without uh, direct adhesion to a solid uh, underlying substrate. And that, uh, that uh, uh, trait of cancer cells, that phenotype of cancer cells, is sometimes called anchorage independence. But ultimately, the best litmus test of whether a cell is truly transformed is tumorigenicity, i.e., the ability of a cell, when plucked out of a petri dish like this, and implanted into a host mouse to actually grow into a tumor. So there are various gradations of becoming transformed, but tumorigenicity is, is the ultimate arbiter of whether or not a cell is truly transformed. Now, you'll recall from our discussion last time that if you put uh, a transformed cell amidst a monolayer of uh, um, normal cells, that the transformed cell will overgrow the monolayer, it will have lost contact inhibition, and that when viewed from above, such a petri dish yields a thick clump of cells, which is called a focus, plural foci. Um, and I will tell you that beginning in the late 1960s, one began to use a variety of different techniques with which to transform normal cells into cancer cells. One of the techniques one used was to apply chemical carcinogens to cells. And keep in mind that we're reserving the word carcinogen for a chemical or a physical agent that causes cancer. Ultraviolet radiation is a carcinogen, as is uh, x-rays, as are x-rays. And there are many chemical carcinogens, such as those in tobacco smoke. And certain experiments in the early um, uh, 1970s began to reveal that one could get foci of transformed cells by applying chemical carcinogen to these cells in vitro. And when I say in vitro, I mean growing here in the Petri dish. Um, and uh, in fact, one could begin to use a whole variety of different types of carcinogens, chemical carcinogens. And what seemed to be shared in common between all these carcinogens was that they were all mutagenic. By mutagenic, I clearly mean the ability to inflict damage on the genome of the cells that were being exposed to these various compounds. In fact, one could draw an interesting correlation because many of these mutagenic compounds had also, by chance, been tested in laboratory animals for their carcinogenicity. And so plots were derived in the mid-1970s between the mutagenic potential of a compound and the carcinogenic carcinogenic potential of a compound. And when I say carcin uh, a carcinogen, how carcinogenic is a compound, I mean how many milligrams of this compound does it take to, to make a tumor? And so what one could do is plot over a log-log scale how many, how many milligrams of a given compound it re was required, or micrograms, to make a tumor in a, in a rat or a mouse. And at the same time, how mutagenic were these compounds, i.e., how potent were they in their ability to inflict damage on the genome? Because it turns out that if, if this log-log scale is by orders of magnitude, powers of 10, compounds range over uh, at least five or six orders of magnitude in their potency in inflicting mutations, and similarly in their potency in inducing uh, tumors in, um, in mice and rats. And what one found was the following, that there was a log-log relationship. It was roughly linear, but there were violations to this. Some compounds were extraordinarily uh, mutagenic. They could create mutations in very low doses, and at the same time could create tumors. They were carcinogenic in very low doses. Other compounds 
uh, required an enormous amount of material in order to induce mutations on the abscissa and an enormous amount of material in order to induce tumors on the ordinate. And this log-log relationship over five orders of magnitude suggested the following obvious idea, that carcinogens are mutagenic, and to the extent that carcinogens are able to induce cancer, they de do so through their ability to inflict mutational damage on, t on the cells within certain target tissues. And this therefore obviously suggested the notion that within cancer cells, as we said last time, there are mutant genes, and that these mutant genes are moreover uh, instrumental in conferring the transformed phenotype on the cells that carry these mutant genes. In the, in the uh, uh, late 1960s and early 1970s, a man named Howard Temin began to use a virus called Rouse sarcoma virus, which had first been discovered in 1909 by a man named Peyton Rouse. Uh, Rouse was then a, a professor at the Rockefeller Institute, later the Rockefeller University in New York. A Long Island chicken farmer brought in a prized hen of his who had been growing a big muscle tumor, a sarcoma, in her uh, breast muscle and asked Rouse, the famed chicken doctor, whether he could cure this um, chicken. And Rouse said, thank you, cut off the hen's head, extracted the tumor, and uh, ground up the tumor. And then, after having homogenized the tumor, passed the uh, homogenate through a filter. And this filter would trap all cellular material, but it would allow non-cellular material, or material that was smaller than the size of a cell, to pass right through. And so therefore, Rouse took the material that passed through the filter, which you, you can call the filtrate, and he injected the filtrate, which passed through the filter, into a, an, a, a young um, chick. And what he observed thereafter was that that chick soon came down with a uh, sarcoma in a period of some months. And when he ground up the tumor in that chick and once again injected into another chick, uh, he w once again got a tumor. The fact that the agent which was inducing the cancer and could be transmitted from one animal to the other, from one chicken to the other, was filterable, suggested it was extremely small. And at the time, one had already begun to appreciate the fact that there were subcellular infectious agents, which we now call viruses. And uh, Peyton Rouse made this very important discovery in 1909, 1910. And uh, in 1965, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for this. It's a rather long wait, wouldn't you say? Uh, so he only had to wait 55 years. Anyhow, he died a happy man, we can only presume. Now, what's interesting about this is the uh, <clears throat> life cycle of Rouse sarcoma virus. As we will discuss in greater detail later, viruses are subcellular particles. They don't have their own energy metabolism and they parasitize on the macromolecular machinery of the cell that they infect. And therefore, uh, what we can imagine here is the following scenario, which actually happens to be true. A virus particle, which is vastly smaller than a cell, enters the cell. The virus particle carries into the cell its own genome. And this genome, in this case of um, Rouse sarcoma virus, is single-stranded RNA. And this genome, which is carried into the cell, carries the information for making more virus particles. And what happens is, in the case of Rouse sarcoma virus, as Temin uh, later speculated in a speculation that caused him ridicule and ostracism for many years, that the single-stranded RNA of Rouse sarcoma virus, once it gets into the cell, is reverse transcribed, i.e. copied into DNA molecules, So now we have double-stranded DNA, a double-stranded DNA copy of the viral genome. And this double-stranded DNA molecule, which became to be called a provirus, then became integrated into the host chromosomal DNA. So here's the host chromosome. And now the, vir the provirus, which I'll depict here in the middle in white, became physically inserted as a double-stranded DNA molecule. It was slipped right into the genome. We now realize that any of, uh, of tens or hundreds of millions of different sites in the genome of the host cell. And this provirus, once established or integrated into the genome, could thereafter 
function essentially like a cellular gene, i.e., from a molecular biological perspective, it was indistinguishable from a cellular gene. It was double-stranded DNA. It had a promoter. It carried in a promoter with it, and it had a polyadenylation signal. And therefore, this provirus thereafter could use or parasitize the host cell RNA polymerase II to make viral messenger RNA on the one hand and progeny genomic RNA. Now, when I say genomic, I'm not talking about the host cell genome. I'm talking about the viral genome. How big is the virus? Well, it's about 9 or 10 kilobases in length. So its genome, obviously, is vastly smaller than the 3.2 megabases that constitute the haploid human genome. The viral mRNA, once transcribed in the nucleus and exported in the cytoplasm, could make viral proteins. And the viral proteins could then be used to encapsidate. And when I use the word encapsidate, keep in mind, I never use a simple word when a polysyllabic one is possible. So when, I, uh, when the, uh, the, the viral proteins encapsidate the viral RNA, you get a virus particle like this which has viral proteins on the outside, almost on the outside, viral RNA in the middle, single-stranded RNA. And this single-stranded RNA comes from the transcription of the provirus that has now been integrated into the genome. Integration is an important concept here, i.e., it becomes covalently linked. And uh, this suggests to us that the virus actually encodes several specialized proteins. One set of specialized proteins is required for the reverse transcription. And in fact, the virus actually carries with it into the cell not only its RNA, but also reverse transcriptase. So if you isolate the virus particle, it has, in addition to this coat, it has within it already reverse transcriptase molecules, so that the moment that this virion, a virion is a virus particle, the moment this virion or virus particle penetrates into the cytoplasm of the cell, there is then immediately an abundant uh, supply of deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates. The process of reverse transcription can begin. The double-stranded DNA can be produced, exported to the cytoplasm, where a second viral protein is responsible for integrating the resulting double-stranded reverse transcript into the host cell genome. Again, that's a highly specialized function. The, the forward transcription, we've just talked about reverse transcription, but the forward transcription to make progeny RNA obviously can rely on the host cell polymerase. The virus doesn't need to make that. The viral mRNA can be translated by host cell ribosomes in the cytoplasm. The virus doesn't need to make that. Some of the, viral RN, the new viral RNA is genomic RNA, which, as I say, becomes encapsidated to make progeny virus particles. And a cell which is infected in this way can suffer two fates. It could be, as is in the case with many viruses like this, that the virus, that the cell is not actually killed by this infection, i.e., that the cell can tolerate an, infectious effect, an infection like this, and therefore, if you look at such a cell, for days and weeks later, it will be producing virus particles, which are being released from the cell continuously, or continually, released from the cell um, and are able then to pass and infect yet other cells. The alternative to this is what is called a cytopathic effect. And the truth of the matter is many kinds of viruses, when they go and infect a cell and they produce their progeny, they end up killing the cell that they've infected. So for example, when we get infected by a cold virus, which has a different metabolism than this one, by the way, then the cells that are infected and produce progeny virus particles are rather quickly killed as a consequence of the infection, which is why we have damage to our nasal mucosa. But in this case, in the case of Temin's uh, uh, virus, actually RSV, Rouse sarcoma virus, that isn't the case. And therefore, in fact, one has uh, RSV particles that are continually being released from the cell. If one looks under the electron microscope at the surface of a virus-infected cell, it actually, one sees structures like this. Where here is in the green is the lipid bilayer, the plasma membrane of the cell. And here in the middle is a viral protein capsid, a protein capsid like this encoded by the virus, 
and carried in the capsid is actually, uh, are actually the viral RNA molecules and the reverse transcriptase molecule. And in saying that, what I mean to suggest to you is that actually the, the viral particle, the virion, is slightly more complicated than I've represented it to be. As the virus, as progeny particles are made, they are pushed out through the plasma membrane of the infected cell, on which occasion they become enveloped with a layer of plasma membrane. And this layer of plasma membrane is actually stolen from, as a patch from the uh, plasma membrane of the infected cell. So in truth, actually, a, a, a virus particle like RSV has some membrane around it. It has um, a protein capsid encoded by the viral mRNAs, and in the middle it has RNA and reverse transcriptase molecules. Note, by the way, that most viruses, actually everything that a virus carries, the virus has encoded in its own genome. In this case, the virus has stolen, has absconded with a patch of plasma membrane from the infected cell. Now, what Temin observed, uh, several other people before him had done so, was that when he infected a monolayer of uh, chicken cells with uh, Rouse sarcoma virus, he was able to, in fact, uh, observe the appearance of foci of transformed cells. And he observed that these foci of transformed cells actually released Rouse sarcoma virus. So the uh, infection by Rouse sarcoma virus had led to the production of progeny virus particles, which we kind of expect of a virus. Keep in mind that if a virus can't produce progeny, it's out of business. Or to put it another way, the only thing a virus is really interested in is making more copies of itself. So the cells in these foci of transformants were, uh, they were transformed, but they were also releasing progeny virus particles. And if you took these virus particles, and he could isolate them away from any contaminating cell, the way Ra Peyton Rouse did, just by filtering them, or, or the filter will trap all of the cells and allow the much tinier virus particles to pass through, then he could take these virus particles and infect another plate of cells, and once again, he would get foci of transformants. And therefore, this virus was actually bipotentially, could do two things. It could replicate. Here I've been talking about the the life cycle or the replication cycle of the virus on the one hand, and on the other hand, it could transform cells. And subsequent work demonstrated that actually the replicative functions of Rouse sarcoma virus on the one hand, and the transforming functions of Rouse sarcoma virus on the other hand, were encoded in separable genes. For example, um, Howard Temin was able to demonstrate and others later that one could get mutants of RSV that had lost the ability to um, transform cells but could still replicate perfectly well. And there were yet other mutants that had lost the ability to replicate but could transform perfectly well. And so there were two classes of specialized genes, one involved in replication, the other in transformation. In 1975 and 1976, the laboratories of Harold Varmus and Mike Bishop at University of California, San Francisco, or UCSF as it's called in the trade, um, began to examine the origin of the viral transforming gene. Now the viral, viral transforming gene, because it was assumed there was only one of them, the genome is so small, it only has about 10 kilobases and only enough room for three or four or five genes in it, not, not 100 or 1,000. The viral transforming gene came to be called SARC, S-R-C. And what they observed was the following. They made a radio-labeled probe which was specific for the SARC gene. And they could use the radio-labeled probe to anneal to two kinds of viruses, wild-top Rouse sarcoma virus and a deletion mutant. I'll use the, word, I'll use the Greek delta uh, uh, a version of Rouse sarcoma virus, which was l lacking, which had apparently through a process of genetic deletion, was lacking the ability to transform cells. And that loss of the ability to transform cells was ostensibly due to the deletion from its genome of the SARC gene. And what they observed is that the SARC, radio-labeled SARC probe, as one would have hoped, was able to anneal to this wild-type genome, but it couldn't anneal to the deletion mutant of RSV, which had lost the SARC gene through a process of genetic deletion. So, so far, so good. By the way, the fact that the SARC gene could transform cells 
re led to its being called an oncogene. The term onkos in Greek means a tumor or a lump. An oncogene, therefore, was a cancer-causing gene. And therefore, Rouse sarcoma virus possessed at least one cancer-causing gene or oncogene. Now, the mind-blowing result that happened uh, shortly thereafter was the following. People in the of Armas Bishop lab began to look for the origins of the SARC oncogene of Rouse sarcoma virus. It turns out that the vast majority of genes that have been in virus, that are present in viral genomes, have been in viral genomes as far as we know for the last billion years. I.e., we have every reason to think that the evolutionary origins of viruses can be traced into the distant past. It could even be the case, some people think, some perfectly sane people think, that this whole retrovirus life cycle that I've just told you about recapitulates one of the earliest stages of cellular evolution on the planet. People believe now with ever-increasing conviction, and keep in mind, class, people who are convinced of something are usually wrong in a loud voice, but people believe with ever-increasing conviction that the first cells on Earth actually had RNA genomes rather than DNA genomes, and that the invention of double-stranded DNA genomes in cellular life forms came later. And if it did, then the conversion from an RNA to a DNA state is uh, reflected in the modern uh, life cycle of Rouse sarcoma virus and similar viruses, which, as you may know, have come to be called retroviruses simply because they transcribe their nucleic acid backwards. So, um, <clears throat> Varmus and Bishop were interested in the origins of the SARC oncogene that was carried by Rouse sarcoma virus. I say, well, it probably the Rouse sarcoma virus had antecedents which existed thousands and millions of years ago and carried the SARC oncogene. But the fact of the matter is the SARC, uh, the, the Rouse sarcoma virus had only been isolated once in the 20th century when this very trusting um, and caring Long Island chicken farmer came into Peyton Rouse hoping that Rouse would cure his chicken rather than cutting the chicken's head off. So what happened then was the following. They used this radio label probe to look at the DNA of infected RSV-infected chicken cells and uninfected chicken cells. So they probed the DNA of the infected chicken cells with this radio-labeled probe, and they probed the DNA with uninfected chicken cells, of uninfected chicken cells, once again with this radio-labeled probe. And what they, what they expected to find was the following. It's obvious. In uninfected chicken cells, you don't find any SARC. And in infected chicken cells, you do find SARC because the SARC gene has been brought into the infected cells by the infecting viral genome. Stands to reason, right? Shouldn't be any in the uninfected cells. After the cells are infected, now they have a SARC, at least one copy. They may have multiple copies of the SARC oncogene because I haven't really dictated how many proviruses should be in, I integrated into the genome of an infected cell. And what they found was puzzling and eventually mind-blowing because they found that in the DNA of uninfected chicken cells, they could find a SARC gene. And these uninfected chicken cells had never experienced Rouse sarcoma virus in any form whatsoever. And as a consequence, they began to develop a theory, a model, which turned out actually to be a right on. And the model was as follows, that there was a retrovirus like Rouse sarcoma virus that was the precursor of RSV, and this retrovirus had replication genes but it lacked a transforming oncogene. This retrovirus went into a chicken cell, and when it emerged from the chicken cell, it carried not only the replication genes, but now the SARC oncogene. It had acquired a new gene which it could then use to subsequently transform other cells that it infected. And this itself turned out to be absolutely right. This SARC gene was of cellular origin, and in fact, homologs of the SARC gene were present in all vertebrates, in all chordates, in all metazoa. There's even a distant homolog of the SARC gene that's present in sponge cells, which are obviously rather primitive. <clears throat> 
So this CERT gene is not of recent invention. It's been sitting around in the eukaryotic genome, at least in the genome of, of um, metazoa and, and even their precursors, for a very long time. It was kidnapped, picked up by the Rouse sarcoma virus, and subsequently exploited by the virus to transform cells that it happened to infect. And this acquisition and activation of a gene was obviously a rare event because RSV, as I've just told you, was only picked up once, was only generated once. It didn't exist in nature, and Rouse sarcoma virus was never seen to go from one chicken flock to the, to the other, like most infectious agents. The ecology of Rouse sarcoma virus is not so much of interest to us. What is of greatest interest to us in our discussion today is the following notion, that within the normal genome of a chicken cell, there exists a normal gene which came to be called a proto-oncogene, a precursor of the, a proto-oncogene, which resides in normal chicken DNA and the fact that the proto-oncogene is highly conserved evolutionarily dictates to us that this proto-oncogene, this SARC proto-oncogene, must mediate essential functions, otherwise it would have long ago been lost. In fact, uh, just to repeat myself, virtually identical copies of the SARC oncogene, proto-oncogene, excuse me, lie, can be found in the genomes of all vertebrates. So a proto-oncogene is a normal cellular growth regulating gene, which on this occasion became activated and subverted and converted into an active transforming gene, i.e. an oncogene. So the term proto in this case implies a normal gene which has the potential under certain circumstances to become an active oncogene. In the years that followed, it's been almost 30 years now, more than 30 proto-oncogenes have been discovered by looking at retroviruses like RSV. SARC is not the only proto-oncogene that lies in our genome. And therefore, we begin to appreciate on the basis of this that our genome carries a whole repertoire of these growth-regulating genes that, uh, when a uh, retrovirus happens to swoop in, can be activated into active oncogenes. They can be converted into active oncogenes, and thereafter, they can induce cancer. And this obviously leads to the suggestion that the seeds of human cancer don't lie necessarily on the outside of cells because most kinds of human cancers are not caused by infecting viruses. That was a puzzle that was already apparent in the late 1970s. If Rouse sarcoma virus or similar viruses could not be invoked to explain many kinds of viruses, how could one get cancer? And this work suggested an obvious solution. Let's imagine that there are a repertoire of a dozen or two dozen or three dozen proto-oncogenes that reside in our normal genome. Their purpose there is not to create cancer. Their purpose is to regulate normal cell proliferation. These genes, being genes, are subject to damage, to mutation. And therefore, we can imagine that in cases of human cancer where there's no virus involved, there can be genetic alteration of the DNA sequences of a proto-oncogene that converted into an oncogene, i.e., chemical changes to the DNA, mutagenic changes to the DNA can mimic the conversion of a proto-oncogene to an oncogene without any virus. There are other ways by which you can skin this cat. And one experiment to demonstrate that is the following. Did we talk at the end of last time about the, the guy who got a bladder carcinoma after 40 years of smoking? I'm glad we did. Good. So let's say this person gets a, had a bladder carcinoma, and he had it for, uh, and he got the bladder carcinoma, so when, and, and it was called an EJ bladder carcinoma. And he got it for reasons that we described last time, and I can't imagine you have any illusions about whether smoking is good or bad for you after last time. But anyhow, so EJ bladder carcinoma, take DNA from the tumor. So we make tumor DNA. And now, uh, and by the way, we presume correctly that viruses have nothing to do with this particular uh, um, uh, cancer, with the development of this cancer. And by the way, the development of a disease is another wonderful polysyllabic Greek word. Pathogenesis. Pathogenesis means the study of how a disease is caused, what generates the disease. So the pathogenesis of bladder carcinoma has nothing whatsoever to do with any viruses. Maybe it had to do with the fact that cigarette smoke mutated genes, mutated proto-oncogenes, 
in the DNA of Mr. Jones, that happens to have been his name, or his pseudonym, who knows, Mr. Jones' bladder cells. So one takes tumor DNA here, and one uses the procedure of transfection, where you take the DNA, naked DNA, and you put it into normal cells by a gene transfer or a transfection procedure. So uh, this is transfection or gene transfer. These are equally applicable names. And what was found on this occasion was that one got foci of transformed cells. And these foci, for all practical purposes, look just like the foci that Howard Temin had gotten years earlier by infecting monolayers of chicken cells with Ralph's sarcoma virus. And therefore, that suggested very strongly that the DNA of the bladder carcinoma carried within it a, an oncogene that was capable of transforming these recipient cells into which the DNA had been introduced by the transfection procedure. It remained, of course, to actually find that. I'll mention to you in passing that one does a control experiment here. If you take normal DNA and you do the exact same experiment, you never get foci. So that means that it's not as if all human DNA carries oncogenes in it. The normal DNA doesn't give you foci. The DNA from the bladder carcinoma does give you foci. And so uh, about 20 years ago, one actually looked at the normal DNA and the tumor DNA. And one came up with the following, that the bladder carcinoma oncogene was about, let's say, 6 kb long. There was a corresponding normal proto-oncogene. It was also 6 kilobases long. This was in normal DNA. This was extracted by cloning, gene cloning, from the genome of the bladder carcinoma. And having extracted it, one then began to look at how different these two genes were from one another. This transformed cells. This did not transform cells. If one did restriction enzyme mapping, one found the identical array of restriction enzyme sites. So it was clear that even though these two genes, we can call the normal one a proto-oncogene, these two genes were structurally identical. They couldn't be absolutely identical because biologically they were behaving very differently. And so when the uh, sequence analyses were done, it was discovered that the difference between the normal proto-oncogene and the oncogene was a single point mutation, a single base pair change. And that single base pair change created a potent oncogene. And that single base pair change one could show in comparable tumors was a somatic mutation. Remember, we said somatic mutations are mutations that strike the genomes of cells in our soma rather than the germline. That somatic mutation almost surely had struck one of the epithelial cells lining the bladder of Mr. Jones's, uh, Mr. Jones's urinary bladder. How did this work? Well, let's go back to our discussion of growth factor receptors. You recall we talked about them last time. Let's say here's a growth factor receptor at the cell surface. The growth factor receptor sends signals into, into the cell. And such a sequence of signals where you go from A to B to C to D is sometimes called a signaling pathway. Sometimes it's called a signaling cascade. It's a molecular bucket brigade where a passes signals to B, passes signals to C, to D, and so forth. And they cross-communicate with one another to process this incoming signal from the growth factor activated receptor. Now, it turned out that the protein product of this, of the normal proto-oncogene and the bladder carcinoma oncogene sat right down here in the signaling cascade, downstream in the signaling cascade of the growth factor receptor. And the protein product was a very interesting protein. It was a protein which came to be called RAS. In fact, the original proto-oncogene had previously been associated with a retrovirus. But in this case, it was clear that the activation of the proto-oncogene to the oncogene had nothing to do whatever with the intervention of, by a retrovirus or with the acquisition by a retrovirus of a normal proto-oncogene. So RAS has the normal the following normal lifestyle. RAS normally exists in a quiet state, in inactive state, 
where it binds. So here's RAS, and while it's in the quiet state, it binds GDP, guanosine diphosphate, ribosine, uh, GDP. What happens then is that RAS on occasion gets an incoming signal from some upstream activator. And you can imagine what the upstream activator is from here. Keep in mind I'm only focusing now on, let's say, component C of this signaling cascade. So an upstream activator comes in and impinges on RAS. And in so doing, it wants to switch RAS from a quiet to an activated state. So what happens when RAS gets a signal from an, an upstream signal from here? RAS will shed its GDP and will instead allow a GTP to jump aboard. So now a GTP can jump aboard, and now RAS is in its active state up here. And while it's in its active state, it can emit growth stimulatory signals into the cell, like that. I'm not showing you exactly what they look like, but it can emit signals. And this is, by the way, called a signal transducing protein. A protein that transduces signals, receives signals from higher up in the cascade, and passes them on lower into the cascade. So it's transducing these signals. And so RAS is put, here I should have capitalized RAS here. So RAS is now in its active state. It's received upstream signals, it's shed its GDP, it's bound GTP, and while it's there, RAS passes signals on further downstream in the pathway. So if we want to relate it to the signaling cascade, and we imagine that RAS is component C of this cascade, it receives signals from B, and then RAS passes signals on to D. It's sitting in between them. It's an intermediary. It's a member of this molecular bucket brigade. Now what happens is that RAS is in this active state, for only a period of usually milliseconds. And after it's in a period of this active state and it's emitting growth stimulatory signals downstream for a period of milliseconds, RAS does something very interesting. It hydrolyzes the GTP. And when it hydrolyzes the GTP into GDP, obviously an inorganic phosphate comes out, RAS switches itself off, i.e., RAS has an intrinsic GTPase activity. GTPase means it can cleave GTP. So it's as if there were a switch here and I could turn it on. Well, I'm not going to mess with it since I still haven't figured out how the switches work. But it's as if there was a light switch here that I could switch on and the lights would be on for a short period of time and then the switch would automatically shut itself off a negative feedback control to ensure that the period of activation of the RAS protein is only a period of milliseconds and that the pulse of downstream signals that are released is finite, circumscribed, limited. It's only a quantum of signals that are released, after which occasion RAS hydrolyzes GTP and shuts itself off. It's a nice system and it actually works because, as I've told you before, we go through 10 to the 16th cell divisions with RAS proteins in our cells, and rarely, if we lead virtuous lives and listen to everything I said in the last lecture, do we ever get cancer. So, what happens when the RAS encoding gene becomes mutated in cancer? That's another one of those questions that I'm really glad I asked, because what happens is that the ability of the GTPase activity to function is knocked out the GTPase can no longer operate, and therefore the ability of RAS to shut itself off by cleaving GTP down to GDP is now compromised. And as a consequence, RAS is trapped for extended periods of time, for minutes and hours and maybe even days, in this excited signal emitting config configuration, on which occasion it sends out a continuous flood of uh, uh, signals. In fact, we now know that the point mutation which happens in the gene here, and is seen, by the way, in about 20% of human cancers that have virtually identical point mutations, those, that point mutation is in the GTPase domain of the RAS protein that is normally responsible for cleaving GTP into GDP. So now we can begin to get a, a very concrete and specific uh, understanding and insight into the mechanism by which
a point mutation, a somatic mutation, can have a dramatic effect on the ability of a cell to grow. Note, by the way, that if RAS is sending signals constitutively down here, and you may recall that the word constitutive means at a constant and constitutive, a constant and unrelenting fashion. So the, the ability of RAS, which I've depicted as residing right in here in the signal, signaling cascade, to send out signals unrelentingly down like this, means that the signals up here are no longer so important. RAS might require a brief stimulus to get into this activated state, but then it can sit around for hours and days pushing the cell to proliferate. And the subsequent exposure of a cell carrying a RAS oncogene is now gratuitous. It's unnecessary because this downstream signal emitter has gone wild and is firing and pushing the cell to grow unrelentingly. Interestingly, that signal is very critically important in pushing cells to move through the G1 phase of their growth and division cycle. In other words, it's during that phase of the division cycle that RAS is actually able uh, to send its signals that perturb cell cycling and push the cell to uh, move from the G1 up to the restriction point and thence into the remaining part of the cell cycle. So now we see how somatic mutations, and we now know about dozens of such genes, can convert proto-oncogenes to oncogenes without the intervention of any retrovirus. There are yet another class of genes which are called tumor suppressor genes. And these tumor suppressor genes operate in exactly the opposite way as proto-oncogenes and oncogenes. The proto-oncogenes and the oncogenes, from what I, I've uh, told you, you can imagine, are functioning analogously to accelerator pedals on a car. They push the cell to proliferate, and when you have a cancer, the accelerator pedal gets stuck to the floor. In other words, it's no longer well regulated. The tumor suppressor genes work in an opposite fashion as a braking system to slow down cell proliferation. And as such, tumor suppressor genes operate to counteract and counterbalance and limit the growth stimulatory signals that are coming from the RAS uh, gene and other growth promoting genes. So there's two sides to the coin. Indeed, as you can imagine from circuit theory, any positive signal must be counterbalanced by a negative signal so that you end up having some kind of physical balance that is compatible with normal biological function. So these tumor suppressor genes are normally functioning as break break linings of a cell, if you will. And that also describes how they become involved in cancer. The mutation that struck the RAS gene caused a hyperactivation of the proto-oncogene. The proto-oncogene was hyperactivated, and now it began sending out an unrelenting stream of growth singulatory signals. As you can imagine, as it is too intuitively obvious, in the case of tumor suppressor genes, when they became involved in cancer, what, ha what kind of mutations affect them? Inactivating mutations. So there's a very interesting gene. It's called the retinoblastoma gene. And the retinoblastoma gene, retinoblastoma is a rare eye tumor of children. It happens about once in 20,000 kids. And the retin retinoblastoma gene, if you look at the retinoblastoma gene in the genomes of tumor cells, these are eye uh, cells that form the, the precursors, the rods and the cones and other neuronal cells in the in lining the retina. Here's the normal retinoblastoma gene, and it's 190 kilobases long. So it's a pretty nice sized gene. It's not the biggest, but it's not the smallest. If you look at many retinoblastoma tumors, what you find is that there are major portions of the gene that have been just deleted. Here I'll show you one deletion. Here's another deletion. Here's a third deletion. Sometimes the whole gene is deleted and cut out. Obviously, such deletions are not enhancing the function of the retinoblastoma gene. Obviously, they're wiping it out. And therefore, we can begin to imagine that the way the tumor suppressor genes are recruited into the process of forming cancer is through their elimination rather than through their hyperactivation. In fact, as you might also imagine, a cell which has the following genotype, RB plus, RB minus, actually grows normally. 
Why? Because one of the two alleles has been inactivated, the minus, but the other allele is still, is still uh, active and still functional and still able to create an adequately functional brake lining. Only when a cell becomes RB minus like this, homozygous minus, does it begin to grow uncontrollably because now it lacks all ability to manufacture the normally required brake lining. And this begins as well to explain certain kinds of hereditary cancers because in certain individuals they inherit a defective allele of the RB gene and therefore at the moment of conception they have the following genotype. Well you'll say that's all that's fine because each of their cells has a wild type copy of the RB gene and a, and a mutant defective copy. And the wild type copy, as you will correctly say, suffices to template, to orchestrate, to program normal cell behavior. Why do they then get uh, retinoblastomas? Because the surviving wild type gene, right, or the gene copy, the wild type allele, can be lost with a certain finite probability per cell generation through chromosomal mistakes, accidents, or through crossing overs. And so roughly in one in 10 to the six cells, one has an event, a genetic accident, which causes the accidental loss of the surviving RB allele, leading, RB wild type allele, leading now to a genotype that looks like this, homozygous mutant or homozygous inactive and now a rare cell in which that has happened now begins to proliferate uncontrollably because of the absence of the uh, RB brake lining which is normally required to, um, to uh, control cell proliferation. By the way, I'll tell you in passing without describing the gory details that the RB protein works at the end, at the restriction point. Did we, we talked about the restriction point last time. You remember? The RB protein actually prevents the cell from advancing through the restriction point gate unless it becomes inactivated and then the cell can sail through into the rest of the cell cycle. In cells that lack the RB protein, the guardian of the restriction point gate is no longer there and therefore the gate is held open and cells can sail all the way through G1 in an unimpeded fashion without the RB protein standing at the restriction point gate and saying advance no further unless and until certain conditions have been uh, um, satisfied. And so we can begin to understand that the R tumor suppressor gene, the RB gene, is able to act in a, as a quality control to ensure that cells don't inadvertently, in, 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 inappropriately pass through the restriction point gate into the rest of the cell cycle. And by now there are 40 or 50 different kinds of tumor suppressor genes that are found to be inactivated through various mechanisms in human cancers. This was only the progenitor, the, the, the harbinger of, of those. How many tumors does a, uh, a, a child who's born like this get in, in his eyes or her eyes? Well, it might get two or three or four in both eyes, but that reflects the fact that there are maybe a million or two million cells in each of the retinae which are susceptible to this loss of the surviving wild type gene copy. Having heard all that, you will ask me, well, why don't they get tumors all over the body? Since it is the fact that the RB protein regulates the restriction point gate in all cells throughout the body. So therefore, why isn't a child who's born constitutionally, whose genetic inherited makeup is this. Why isn't a child like this sensitive to developing tumors all over his or her body? In fact, children who are born genetically with this genotype get retinoblastomas with high probability early in life and as teenagers they often come down with osteosarcomas which are tumors of the bones. But otherwise they don't get many kinds of cancer. And the answer to your question is I haven't the vaguest idea. No one knows why loss of this critical gene that plays a key role in the biology and the metabolism of all cells throughout the body can be lost to yield cancer in uh, the eye and in the bone. Whereas when the same gene, which must be lost elsewhere in other tissues in the body is lost, 
tumors do not arise. And on that puzzling note, uh, I wish you a pleasant day, another happy Halloween, and see you on... Oh, yes, tomorrow is uh, Election Day. Don't forget to vote. And remember what the mayor of Boston once said, vote early and often. <laughs>